How are we doing, guys? Welcome to another All Leeds TV live stream. We're joined by very, a very, very special guest today. Um, you might not recognise him, actually, yeah, to, be, to be fair. It's the first time we've put a name to the face as such. Um, but it is Jamie Ralph from Yule's Old Boys England. I'm sure you guys will have heard them on Twitter. Um, absolutely top quality accounts. How are things going, mate? Great, Oscar, and hello, Danny, as well. Uh, thanks for inviting me on the uh, channel today. Um, looking forward to talking about all things news, old boys, Bielsa, and uh, a bit of Leeds as well, hopefully. And Danny, how are you doing, mate? I'm good, mate. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to speak a lot louder today. Uh, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully it's not a potato I'm filming through today. But yeah, nice to meet you, Jamie, and welcome to the, uh, the stream. You too. Thanks a million. So I think the only place to start with Jamie is that um, I'll have to be honest. When I first saw the account, you was all boys England. I think we just discussed it before it went alive on there. I did not. I, I I had an image of. I didn't have an image of a British person running the channel. To be honest, but um, just let us know how you got into supporting you was all boys. What's your story behind supporting you was all boys in the first place? Yeah, it's the most. Common question I get from people, how does a, an Irish guy end up supporting Newell's Old Boys, running an English account about Newell's Old Boys? Um, so my story is, it kind of starts about four years ago. Um, I might as well get this out in the open. I'm a Tottenham fan, and I hope that uh, that doesn't offend people uh, too much. But the, the way that I got into Newell's and Bielsa is very much the same way that Leeds fans are coming on board now and starting to follow Newell's in that, in uh, 2014, uh, Spurs appointed Maurizio Pochettino as manager. And Pochettino uh, played for Newell's Old Boys, started his career there, won titles under Marcelo Bielsa at, at, uh, at Newell's. So at the time, I was actually living in London. I, I had a season ticket at Spurs for about six years. I, I went to the old White Hart Lane. I went to uh, Wembley and I've been at the new stadium as well. And at the time, uh, Pochettino was appointed it was coming up to the first uh, North London derby between Spurs and Arsenal. And I remember watching Sky Sports and they were interviewing Pochettino. And they said to him, you know, are you ready for your first North London derby? Arsenal Spurs, one of the biggest rivalries in England in world football. It's going to be really fiery. It's going to be tackles flying in. You know, uh, are you ready for it, Pochettino? And he said, he said, of course I'm ready for it. He said, I've played in the Clasico Rosarino for New Old Boys. I've scored in it against Rosario Central. He said, that's a derby. He said, go and look that up. He said, uh, you know, if I can survive that derby, then I can definitely survive the North London derby. So what did I do straight away? I went to online on YouTube. I was looking up the classical Rosarino, looking up everything about Newell's Old Boys. I'd heard of them. I knew that Messi had come from there. I knew about Bielsa. But I didn't really know about the history of the club and, you know, the fact that they had an English name as well. Newell's Old Boys um, sort of appealed to me. So I started to look them up and I started to get really into it just from, the, from those words of, that Pochettino said and from following Spurs and the fact he'd come from there. And at the time, um, it was really hard to follow Newell's Old Boys if you didn't speak Spanish, which I didn't. And I, I still don't speak great Spanish. It's definitely improved through running the account. Um, so there was no way for English speakers to follow Newell's. I started to watch the matches online. I was, like, I was looking up dodgy betting streams at midnight on a Sunday night to try and watch Newell's. I learned a lot about the club, I read stuff online and through, through Google Translate. Um, and then I thought, oh, there must be a Twitter account. You know, there must be an English Twitter account that I can follow the club because I wanted to become more familiar with the players and what was actually happening at the time at the club. So I went online and there was, there was no uh, Twitter account. There was a, an official English Twitter account, but it was like posting one tweet per month. And it was like the English was poor. So it, it was obviously just something that had been put through Google Translate. And it didn't tell me a lot about the club or or you know, how they were doing in the league. Um, so I just decided to do it myself. I just thought, well, this is a, 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 an opportunity to set up a Twitter account. And, and I could see there was Newell fans who spoke English uh, on Twitter. So I, thought, I said, I'll, I'll just do it myself. I'll use Google Translate. I'll rewrite the news that the, the journalists in Rosario are writing. And uh, I did it myself. And um, I had about a thousand followers, I think, for up until uh, Bielsa took over at Leeds in 2018. And then, I, I started a thread to explain about Bielsa's legacy at Newell, and then overnight there was like 3,000 new followers. And since then, it's just, it's just been mental, lads. It's just been crazy, like, you know. Um, but it's, it's, been, it's been great. I, I've met so many friends through it. I've, I've been over to Newell's, to Argentina. I've been over to Leeds. Um, 
So that's my, my long story is that I was a Spurs fan. Pochettino took over. He started talking about news in the media. And then I was just hooked. And I think that's, that's been the case for a lot of Leeds fans. Since Bielsa has mentioned news and since Leeds fans have found out about news, they've had the yeah. same experience as me, you know. Yeah. Can, um, just for, the, for the, the Leeds fans that don't really know much about Newell's, can you just explain where it is, you know, the, the affiliates and rival? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. So Newell's Old Boys are based in Rosario, which is the third city in Argentina. It's about three hours from Buenos Aires. And uh, so many of the big clubs, what they call the Grandes in Argentina from Buenos Aires. So Boca Juniors and River Plate are, are the two most well-known. But you have clubs like Independiente, San Lorenzo, Racing Club as well. And they're traditionally known as the big five, the big clubs in Buenos Aires. And then you have Newell's Old Boys from Rosario. And you have Rosario Central, who are Newell's Old Boys rivals, who are also from Rosario. So Rosario is the third biggest city, and it's a two-club city. So there's, there's two, two main clubs that they play in the, in the Premier Division in Argentina at the moment. And there's a real, real hatred there between the two clubs. Uh, it's, it's something that I ha- haven't seen. It's kind of, I, I try to explain it as on a kind of a Rangers Celtic level, you know, um, right, okay, real, hat- right. real hatred there. Yeah. Um, you know, and, it, and it's, it's, it goes outside of football. There's, there's, there's a lot of violence involved and, um, you know, you're either one team or the other and, and you, you, there's a real hatred. Apart from that, Newell's Old Boys was founded in 1903, and the name comes from uh, an Englishman, actually. Uh, Isaac Newell was uh, um, born in, in Kent in a town called Strood, and he emigrated to Rosario in the late 1800s. And then he, he set up a school, so he's a headmaster of an English school in Rosario. And uh, he then had a son called Claudio Newell. And Claudio, a few decades later, decided that the, the sport of football had reached Argentina through British emigrants and Scottish emigrants. And Claudio then decided to start up this football team. And when he was looking for a name, he decided to dedicate it after his, his father, Isaac, who'd come from England. And he came up with Newell's Old Boys. Newell's, Newell was their, was their surname. Um, and that was 1903. And, and since then, Newell's have won seven titles in Argentina. The first one, 1974. And the latest one in, in 2013. And really, uh, the period uh, since Marcelo Bielsa took over as manager in Newell's in 1990. And that was a glory period for the club. And uh, he did a lot of work with a guy called Jorge Grifa, uh, who is, many Leeds fans might know as Bielsa's um, mentor. Uh, there was yes. actually a crowdie of them that I paid for in, in, at Elland Road over the last uh, couple of months. But they did so much work with the youth academy and developing players since the, the late 80s. And that has um, meant that Newell's has developed and created so many Argentine players that fans of European football will know. Obviously, the most famous is Lionel Messi, but you know the list goes on after that. So um, Newell's see themselves as the biggest club outside Buenos Aires. Um, that's how, how the, the club's fans see themselves. Uh, the club is nicknamed La Lepra, which is leprosy, and the fans are known as Los Leprosos, which is the lepers. Uh, so it's a, it's a very unique nickname, I think, and that was something that kind of drew me to them as well. And that comes from the fact that uh, back in the 1920s, uh, Newell's Old Boys and their, their rivals, Rosario Central, who were founded by Scottish immigrants, actually, from a railway station in Rosario, uh, they were asked to play a friendly for um, uh, lepers, essentially people suffering from leprosy. Um, and Newell's said, yeah, we'll play the friendly, no problem, let's do it, to raise money for lepers. And Rosario Central said, no, we're not playing it. So Newell's became known as the, the club who supported the Lepers, and, and they became known as the Lepers. And then um, Rosario Central from that, they got the nickname of Canasias, which is scoundrels. They, they decided not to play the friendly for, for Leper victims. So, so that has carried on through to today. That's the nicknames. And uh, as I said, there's a huge rivalry between those clubs. I mean, what I found interesting was, obviously you mentioned uh, Jorge Galifa. Um, I mean, reading Bielsa's um, book, um, over the last, I mean, there's been several published in that lot. I mean, what was very interesting was back in, I think it was November 2018, I think it was, uh, Bielsa's massive donation to uh, Newell's of 3.2 million, I think it was. Um, but the big thing he always mentions when he talks about Newell's is that he can't, in his mind, understand why he's so loved and then Jorge Grifa, to an extent, kind of his mentor, doesn't really get the same. Obviously, he gets a lot of respect to an extent, but 
Biel's is kind of the main man, is what, from what I can kind of tell between the two to an extent. I mean, wh- why is that to an extent, Jamie? That um, Bielsa is the one kind of out of news's whole history that's just captured the imagination the most. I think, yeah, it's a great question, actually. And, like, you can speak to many Newell fans, and there is Newell fans out there that say, actually, Grief is number one in terms of Newell's old boy's idols. He's number one because he, he taught Bielsa, a lot of people say, everything he knows, you know, and, and, and Bielsa learned so much from Grief. Grief played for Newell's in the 50s, and he went to Atletico Madrid in Spain, and he had a long career with them, so he's a, he's a legend at Atletico Madrid. And he returned to Argentina after his career and uh, became a youth coach. Uh, and became a, a coach and really focused on developing young players uh, in the Newell's Academy. His early work was so successful with developing these players that he, he also went to Boca Juniors. So not a lot of people know that he worked for, for Boca Juniors for many years and he, he developed players like Carlos Tevez. You know, there's players from, from Boca, the Boca Juniors Academy that George Grifa was the one who, who discovered them, you know. Um, and there's the famous story of George Grifa and Bielsa, you know, going in a car to, to find players in, in uh, you know, the, to the ends of Argentina. They, they famously discovered Pochettino in his bed and, and wanted to have a look at his leg. Um, but I think context is a bit of a, uh, is it, yeah, is that, yeah, that yeah. Story these days that would um, wouldn't look great in the newspapers these days. No, I no, no. But it, it's passed up as like, okay, it was fine. They wanted to see, you know, how what Pochettino's legs looked like. So, you know, was he able to? Were they able to develop him as this kind of tough tackle and centre back? But in terms of why Jorge Grifa isn't, you know, lauded, I suppose, as much as Bielsa, is, probably because Bielsa decided he wanted to be the coach of the first team at Newell's, you know, and that he went and won those titles. Um, and Grifa very much, um, I don't think Grifa has won for the limelight as much as Bielsa. He doesn't put himself forward as much to say, you know, I- I'm going to coach the first team. Or He very much does his work in, in the background. Um, he's 83 now, and he's still working at Newell's as director of recruitment. He came back to Newell's, and he's, uh, he's working on a, on, a, on a manuscript, on a book about developing... Uh, youth footballers that he's going to give to Newell's. He's, he's obviously realizing that he probably doesn't have a, another few decades around. So he's going to write everything he knows into a book and give it to Newell's so the academy can be developed. But, um, but his work with, with young players is, is incredible. I mean, just, just go and, and look up the, the amount of players that grief had discovered. Uh, I mean, you could probably build a, an, Ar- an Argentina national team and put them in a World Cup with players just developed by Grifa. Um, so his his work has been has been essential as well to to Bielsa's career and like you said, um, Bielsa funded this new hotel which is on the training ground at Newell's and they've called it after Jorge Grifa. So the stadium was obviously renamed after Marcelo Bielsa. It's now the Estadio Marcelo Bielsa in 2009 and now they've decided to name the training ground after Jorge Grifa, the Jorge Grifa Training Center. Um, so they're they're the two figures really that. Uh, you know, I've, I've, I've done so much for New Old Boys and the success of both the team and the academy and, and for football in Argentina, you know. I mean, got a very interesting comment coming here, um, Jamie. Gustavo, he's a, a Rosario Central fan. So we don't, so we don't, want, any, we don't want any fighting on this live stream anyway. We don't want any violence. No, 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 but no. I find really interesting what you said here. I always respect Bielsa. In our country, there is divided opinion on Bielsa, but... Obviously, as we mentioned off air, we had Nacho on um, live last weekend. And what he said that was quite interesting was that Bielsa does divide opinion. I mean, would you say it's a fair reflection, you know, from your perception of, you know, Argentinian football as a whole? Yeah, that's very fair. Uh, Hi, Gustavo. Um, I'm not going to say anything about your team. I'm going to keep it professional and civil uh, today. But uh, thanks for your comment, because not all Rosario Central fans would share that opinion. And lots of them hate Bielsa. Look. Let's, let's not beat around the bush. Uh, Bielsa is not liked by Rosario Central fans, and there's a reason for that. And, and they, they have a new manager now, a player called Kili Gonzalez, who's now moved into coach, and he played for Valencia and Inter Milan. And he said about Bielsa, and Bielsa coached him uh, at, for Argentina when Bielsa was the national team manager. Kili Gonzalez says, you know, Bielsa ruined my teenage years because he had so much success with Newell. And for those years, 1990 to 92, Newell's old boys were the best team in Argentina. So you can imagine growing up as a Rosario Central fan, what that's like. And a lot of them put that down to Bielsa. 
but the country as a whole, they, they, are, they are divided on Bielsa. And that, a lot of that comes back to the fact that he managed Argentina, I think, between 1998 and 2004. So he was the national team coach. And the 2002 World Cup, people will remember, actually, Argentina were in England's group in uh, Japan and South Korea. There was a lot of good feeling around the Argentina team. Bielsa had, had a great qualifying campaign with them before the 2002 World Cup. And there was a lot of hope. There was a golden generation there. There was players like Batistuta, Hernan Crespo, uh, Juan Sebastian Varane, Pochettino at the back. Um, there was a lot of hope and the whole of Argentina was behind Bielsa. And that campaign was a disaster. They, they didn't get out of the group stages. They lost to England. David Beckham penalty, I think, if I remember correctly. Uh, Pochettino was accused of fouling Michael Owen. Looked like a dive. Um, but Bielsa basically, since then, fans in Argentina haven't forgiven him. And they think that he is all talk, you know. Um, they think that he talks about attacking football. He talks about different tactics. And, uh, but really, they feel that when he got the opportunity to do it on the pitch with Argentina, that he messed up in 2002. A lot of things went wrong for him in that campaign. It wasn't all down to him. You know, there was a lot of uh, unlucky things with that uh, Argentina campaign in 2002. But uh, for Argentina not to make the knockout rounds in 2002, that's unforgivable in the eyes of many uh, Argent Argentinians who don't support Newell's. So people in Buenos Aires, people outside, uh, if they don't follow Bielsa because of his connection to Newell's, they can't forgive him for 2002. Uh, and that's, I think, where a lot of the, the country is, is still divided on uh, the success of Bielsa and, and how he comes across. Well, I think the thing is, Danny, obviously, you know, we're obviously aware of obviously Bielsa, as much as we love him, as much as Newell's love him, there is, you know, sections of different fans who, who absolutely can't stand the man. I mean, obviously, we know Derby fans are not the best, most keen on him, um, Chelsea fans, etc., etc. you know, he does divide the opinion a bit, but um, I think the thing is, obviously, Danny, um, you know, we, we look at Bielsa, we know he's got this history to him. Um, but what I read in the book, and I'm obviously going to bring Jamie into this as well, was the, um, his name has actually escaped me now, actually. Um, but Bielsa changed goalkeepers just before that World Cup, apparently. Um, the goalkeeper who was in place um, had, had an absolutely fantastic qualifying campaign. He dropped him. But what I found interesting was that after the Sweden game, when they'd been knocked out, Bielsa actually started crying, said in the book. He actually started, you know, he teared up in front of the whole, whole players. And the goalkeeper who he dropped went straight over to hug him, was the first person to go, go over and hug him. And, and that's the aura of the man. I mean, how would you sum him up, Danny? How would you sum him up in terms of what he's, what he's done to you as a Leeds fan? <sighs> Uh, me as first and foremost as a Leeds fan, uh, he's made me fall in love with football more. Just the just the exciting high press of football. I mean, we had a team that finished thirteenth, I believe, and then it was it was under a bottom. You know, it was just uh, and then the following season, I think we just had Barry Douglas at left back as a change, and then it, after that Stoke game, we were all just. I can guarantee every Leeds fan were just like, who is this guy? He's, you know, wow. Because it was just a, a completely, like you had to click in the team. We'd been out on loan. Uh, was it Utrecht that he got, he got shipped out to? And he came, and I love the fact that Click said, uh, I'll be back. And I'll be, I'm looking at now, he made what, 92, 93 consecutive starts. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but yeah, but Bielsa, he seems like a, a secretly pas passionate, passionate man. And I'm sure Jamie can elaborate in a minute. That um, I'm sure if he's passionate about Leeds United, I mean, I think he secretly he is. We also we all saw uh, after that defeat when he was in the corridor slouching, you know. And he said, "I shouldn't have done that." Yeah, but, keep going. Where you but, think that was? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we, we all felt that, and it just shows that Bielsa felt it. Now imagine that for your national side. I mean, I'm sure I'm sure I'm sure Jamie can elaborate more on. I mean, it was. Bielsa's, when he won the titles, was his style of football new in Argentina? Was it up and coming, like the high press sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, the high press that you saw 
um, that you see today, you know, at Man City, Pochettino used it at Spurs as well, and Leeds have been using it. If you go back and look at Newell's matches from 1990, it's the same. It's the same idea. It's the same idea, you know, uh, playing the ball out from the back, uh, hunting down your opponent, trying to win the ball back as fast as possible, and moving up the field uh, with a quick counter attack. Um, so at the time, yeah, it was it was a style of football that other teams weren't ready for. They didn't really understand what was happening. Uh, and, you know, Bielsa was a, a trailblazing coach at that time. Um, he was 35 years old. Uh, people didn't know anything about him. Like, you know, at the time he, he had played a few games for Newell's in the 70s. And then he, he went off to try and be a coach. And he was coaching, you know, a university team in Buenos Aires. And then he, he came back to Rosario and he was coaching the kids. He was coaching uh, youth teams at Newell's. So when the opportunity uh, came up, he, he, I think he had done really well with the Newell's reserves in 88, 89. And then the opportunity came up for him to manage the first team. But outside of that bubble, Rosario and Newell's, people didn't know who he was. Um, and then, you know, like, like what you mentioned, Danny, you saw in the first game uh, at Stoke last season. Uh, that's what it was like at Newell's from the start. You know, it was like, oh my God, these players are superhuman. What the hell is going on? Um, I think he benefited. It, there's a lot being said about you know, um, Bielsa's players burning out. He benefits from the fact in Argentina that the, the seasons were only 19 games long. So it was a short burst of matches and then you were a champion at the end. So he didn't have to do the, um, it was a 46 game season, I think, at the championship. And yeah, I, do, yeah. I, do, I do believe that the break for the pandemic this year helped Bielsa. I might, I, that might be a controversial opinion, but I do think that helped because uh, that's what he was used to in Argentina. The, the season is split into two halves. There's a short season at the start and then there's a, a short season at the end and they have a break in between around Christmas to kind of revitalise the squad. So I do think that pan, the break for COVID-19 uh, helped, helped Bielsa this season. Um, but yeah, I mean, all, all I can say is that at Newell's, it was, it was triumph after triumph. There were, were some bad seasons in between. He didn't win every season. Uh, but he seemed to have that trend of Newells would win, then he'd have a bad season, then they'd come back and win again, then he'd have a bad season, and then they'd come back and win again. Um, I think he touched on the point there that he he's a very emotional person. He definitely takes defeats to heart. Um, there are stories about when he when he lost games at Newells, going and, and locking himself in a hotel for days, not talking to anybody. Uh, I think when he left Newells. Um, he went away to some sort of monastery and just stayed up there for four months studying football and, and trying to, I suppose, come to terms with himself and everything that's happened. And um, it's, it's a strange one because he celebrated triumphs at Newell's, um, you know, so strongly. And there's a famous oh, image of him shouting Newell's Caraco. And, and uh, I think that almost gives you a bit of an insight into Bielsa. He, he celebrates when he wins. He makes the most of the celebration, and when he loses, he takes it really badly. But I think he's gotten a bit older now, and at least maybe the celebrations were, were a bit more quiet, and he didn't go as, as mad, I suppose, as he did in his early career, which is understandable. Um, but I wonder, I wonder inside how he, how he really feels about, about, that, about winning the championship. Because um, just going back to the point about people in Argentina, um, you know, maybe not being sold on him, there's certainly... A, a lot of people in Argentina as well, not Newell's fans, but there's certainly a lot of people in Argentina who would still see the championship as maybe a, a second-rate league, you know, and they're waiting to see how he does in the Premier League. But what they don't understand, and a friend of mine, I think he's watching today, uh, Nico. So hello, Nico, if you're watching. Uh, Nico told me that, um, that fans in Argentina, they might say that, oh, it's only a second-rate league, the championship, the Premier League is the top league. They don't understand the history of Leeds and the fact that Leeds were, were giants of English football in the 70s and in the 80s and in the 90s and that they've been down for 16 years. And Nico, my friend, was telling me that, you know, when he explains then, well, you're calling it a second rate league, but actually it, it's, it's the equivalent of a team like San Lorenzo or Independiente or Racing Club in Argentina going down for 16 years and coming back up. And they're like, whoa, really? Like they, they don't realize that, you know, so many managers over the years have tried and failed to get Leeds promoted. How big this is, how big of a deal this is. So um, there's still that feeling in Argentina, oh, it's a second-rate league, but I think it's important to remember the context that Leeds are in and, and the, the work that he's done and the job that he's done 
to, as you said, Danny, kind of make these second rate players who other managers were leaving behind into a championship winning side. And he did that at Newell's as well. There was a lot of, there was a lot of yeah. players who were like, you know, are they actually any good? He made them look like superstars. And it's funny to look at actually some of the players that were really successful under Bielsa. What happened to them after Bielsa wasn't coaching them anymore? There's definitely players you can look at at Newell's who maybe didn't do too much after they won the league with Newell's. But while they were playing under Bielsa, they were world beaters. So I think it'll be interesting yeah. in the future to go back and look at the Leeds team that won the championship, you know, when all is said and done and, and Bielsa has moved on. And actually, let's see how some of those world beat players do in their future careers. And will we be looking back and saying, well, Bielsa just got every last drip of, of blood and sweat out of maybe quite average players? There's, there's a ve- there is a very Bielsa effect on every Leeds United player. And it was only about four years ago I saw people just saw, just sell Phillips, just sell him. He's not good enough. And look at him now. He's probably our, our uh, poster boy for Leeds United. And I, I can guarantee you, like, we, I think we, we turned down offers of 25 million for him last season from Aston Villa. And uh, I'm all unhappy that we're going into the Premier League. Well, I mean, Bielsa has written his place in Leeds United history with, without a doubt. And he'll be immortalised for that. I mean, 16 years is a long time, especially after the stuff that we've been through. Two administrations, bad owners. And, you know, and it's good to see that Bielsa feels that passion for us. A bit like, there's now, there's now you'll see now, Jamie, that there's, there's kind of a link now between Leeds and New Orleans boys, isn't there? I bet you've seen yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, like, um, well, like the, we, we, I started helping Leeds fans to go and visit the Estadio Marcelo Bielsa and Rosario last year. So when Bielsa took over, I'd say about two or three months into, into the season, last season of 2018, I started getting private messages saying, the first one I got was from a guy from Leeds who was studying. It was doing uh, a year in college in Buenos Aires. And he said, look, I want to go to see the Estadio Marcelo Bielsa. And we helped him out and he, and he went to see the game with some Newell fans. And after that, I just, I just started getting messages every week from Leeds fans who were either traveling to South America and decided, look, we've got to go to Rosario, see New Souls boys. Or Leeds fans who in the last year just decided to go to Argentina because of Bielsa. And there's been loads of them. And then... Um, you know, uh, thankfully, I've got some friends who, who are Newell's fans in Rosario, speak great English, who are more than happy to meet the Leeds fans in Rosario, bring them to the game and show them where Bielsa came from. Um, apart from that, I think somebody, I, I'm looking at the comments on the side and somebody's asked the question about Newell's All Boys shirts. Where do you get them? I think I, I have to say I've got thousands of requests for Newell's All Boys shirts. We managed to get some last year. We sold, they sold out. It's really, really difficult. If there's anyone listening that it wants to get a New Old Boys shirt, I, I answer this question every day. New Old Boys do not ship their, their shirts outside of Argentina. They refuse to send them anywhere else. Uh, they're made by Umbro Argentina, which is a completely separate entity to Umbro UK. There's no link there. Um, so there's no, there's no vendor outside of Argentina. So it, it, it's impossible to buy them online. Um, I, what I've been trying to do is... is, is buy them in Argentina and get a box shipped over. I've been trying to do that. Look, it's really hard with the coronavirus. Um, I've actually got a box of Newell's shirts that's been stuck with customs in Dublin for the last two weeks. It's an absolute nightmare. So I'm sorry to anyone who, who's looking for a Newell's shirt. And, and just to go back to what I was saying, I've had thousands of requests. Um, and I, I'm always trying to source them, but it's very difficult. Um, so, so that link with Leeds has become really, really strong. And I talked to someone at the club who works for New Old Boys, and they said, you know, we've had fans from Athletic in Spain, we've had fans from Marseille, we've had uh, Chileans come to New Old because Bielsa managed their team. But we haven't seen uh, anything like the level of support from Leeds for Bielsa in Rosario. Um, so it, 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 I think, you know, so many Leeds fans have, have said to me, we're going to go, we're going to make this pilgrimage to Rosario. Um, so it's it's been amazing, and and all the Leeds fans I've I've made friends with and talked to, like yourselves as well. You know, um, I've been over to Ellen Road last season, and I was treated, you know, brilliantly. Those guys who follow the account who sorted out tickets for me and my brother, we had a few pints in the Peacock. Uh, it was it was brilliant. Um, I think the one word of warning for Leeds fans who want to go to Rosario is, bring your white shirt. Don't bring the one with blue and yellow. Because we had an incident last year. Blue and yellow is the, <laughs> the colour of Rosario Central. 
Uh, and you can't, <laughs> you, you can't wear blue and yellow to the Estadio Marcelo Bielsa. So we had a guy who turned up in blue and yellow. I think it was one of the away shirts. And he was nearly beaten up. I'm not going to beat around the bush, but there was Newell fans who said, you can't bring blue and yellow in here. Get that shirt off you. The police got involved. And my friend, uh, Nico, who's online today, he had to go and explain, no, no, it's a lead shirt. It's a lead shirt. It's not central. It's not blue and yellow. So they managed to get away with it, but it was a, it was a pretty scary situation. So just keep that in mind. The white shirt is fine because Newell's away shirt is white, uh, but blue and yellow don't wear it to Rosario. I know that personally, I mean, I'm one myself. I want to go there one day because from the preview that we put out during the week, just that alone, I mean, it was only a 20 second clip and even that looks crazy. And can you, you said that you went there uh, to the Estadio Marcelo Bielsa and you've been to, I know that you've been to a Leeds game this season, haven't you? Obviously you can't really, last it's, it's too different. Last season, yeah, sorry. yeah, it's two, they're two different types of crowds, but yeah, can you just tell us what you thought about both, please? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, there's a huge difference, there's a huge difference, and I think the fan culture in Argentina, especially around Newell's, is, is what drew me to the club because I mentioned that I had been a season ticket holder at Spurs, and I got to a stage a few years ago where I was falling out of love with the English game a little bit because it's so controlled, it's so sterile. You know, you can't bring a flag into a stadium now. You've got to sit in your seat for the whole whole game. You know, if you sing a song that the, the, the police don't like, you know, you can't sing it anymore. Um, and within reason, there are some terrible and shocking songs that, that fans sing that shouldn't be allowed. But I, I'm saying, I, I'm just trying to make a point. Um, it's totally different in Argentina. You can stand for the whole game. There's safe standing. Uh, there are hundreds of flags in the stadium. Uh, there's, you're not supposed to bring pyro and fireworks in, but, but it gets in and it adds to the atmosphere. Um, there is just singing through, there are parts of the, of, of the stadium who just sing throughout the game. That, I mean, it, it's funny to say, but the fans in there are not even watching the football on the pitch. They're just singing and they're waving flags and they're jumping. Um, and it's just a totally different experience than England. You know, it's a, it, it feels like, you're at a music festival or something. It's, you know, you're standing there. There's, you're all looking at the pitch. There's a real atmosphere of energy. Um, I mean, the other thing you notice is there's a lot more, I, I don't want to say, like when I went to games in England, you know, it's 80% men at the games, you know, men of a certain age. It, it's a lot more diverse in Argentina. There's families. There's, there's a lot of females, girls and women and couples at the games you know i just know that was something i noticed as well about going to games in argentina um you bring the whole family it's not just the, the father and the son going out to watch the football you know everybody's going and and uh yeah i think um the atmosphere is incredible i mean some of the songs they have are great uh and yeah i think they just put a lot more into supporting their team because they're allowed to i mean i mean there's, there's so many restrictions and controls over what you can and what you can't do in an English football stadium now that even if you wanted to create an atmosphere like Argentina, you couldn't. It's, it's, it's restricted. It's not permitted. I mean, what I found really interesting was the when you say after that Leeds fans travelling to New York's old boys. I mean, that to me is a sign of a great manager. The fact that fans of other clubs and not only following their club, they're following the Manchester City, they're attached that close to them. I mean, obviously, you know, Tottenham got Jose Mourinho in charge. What I would argue is that when you talk about the great managers, I don't think Jose Mourinho would ever have that. I think, I don't, I think a lot of the elite managers wouldn't have that. And do you think that is the sign of a top-class, world-class coach who has made a difference to so many people? I, I think it goes beyond him as a football manager and it actually encompasses him as a person and Marcelo Bielsa is a human being and uh, the morals and the principles that he stands for um, because as you said there's, there's many great football managers out there there's Pep Guardiola there's Diego Simeone Maurizio Pochettino there's Jose Mourinho as you mentioned but I don't think there's yeah there's crowds of for example um, Jose Mourinho uh, he started his career I think he was at a smaller club but Porto is where he made his name I don't think there's fans of Spurs now going making pilgrimages to Porto yeah. or Chelsea fans, for example. Um, and, you know, Jose Mourinho is a great football manager, but I don't rate him on the same level as Marcelo Bielsa in terms of his character 
and his morals and his principles. And I don't want to make, you know, I don't know them as people. So I'm not going to say, oh, you know, Mourinho is this person and Bielsa. But what we know as football fans watching them, you know, uh, is Marcelo Bielsa is, is not someone who follows money when he goes and chooses to manage a football team. Um, I don't know if the same can be said for Jose Mourinho. I don't want to compare them, but that's the example, you know, that was that he made. Uh, Bielsa, I think Bielsa could have gone to Real Madrid, Barcelona. I think he could have gone to big teams, Milan, and he, he chose not to because I don't think he wants to walk into a dressing room and manage a team of stars. Um, I mean, I made, I made a point on Twitter one of the days where I said that, uh, can you imagine Marcelo Bielsa trying to manage someone like Neymar? I mean, it's not going to happen. Like it's just a, it's just a clash of good and evil. I mean, there's a lot of um, there's a, talk, talk about people like Neymar. There's a lot of ludicrous rumours linking, obviously, after Barcelona's heavy defeat. It keeps going round and round in circles. There's these links from Lionel Messi to Marcelo Bielsa, a Bielsa against Barcelona. I mean, from your point of view, just talking about that there, that that has to be rubbish, doesn't it? Surely, Jamie. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't think like Bielsa isn't the type to jump at a big opportunity because it comes along, especially in the middle of what he's doing at Leeds. He, look at his career; he, he doesn't do that. He he carefully decides where he wants to manage, and when he chooses a club or a nation, it has to tick certain criteria, you know. And there has to be a project there. There has to be players that he sees, uh, you know, that he can develop. There has to be. If you look at the teams that Bielsa's managed, he's never gone for the big capital city club. He likes the underdog. He likes to go to these smaller regional cities, maybe second cities, third cities, fourth cities. Um, he likes to go to clubs that maybe are sleeping giants, that maybe had success in the past, but are not doing too well at the moment. So Bielsa to Barcelona, like, it's, it's just, you, you can't see it happening. Um, he, Bielsa also managed Espanyol, uh, who are Barcelona's rivals. Um, not to say like he wouldn't go to um, Barcelona because of that, but I think you know his principles would tell us that he, he's not going to go and manage a rival when he managed you know their rival. Um, so I think the human being aspect of Bielsa and what everyone has seen from him in Leeds, the fact that he's not your typical manager uh, like Mourinho or like a lot of the managers who kind of mouth off in England, and um, you know he talks about. We've heard the stories about. Uh, uh, getting Leeds players to pick up litter and telling them that, you know, you're no better than the cleaners and, and the, the manual labourers out there. The same that he did at Newell's. He said, you know, we're here to do a job. I, I don't care about the money you earn. You're, you're not any one better than the fans in the stand. And the fans and the fans are the most important aspect of football. So I think that hum, the human being characteristics that Bielsa has shown, I think, I think Leeds fans have been drawn to that. You know, um, yeah. and because he talks about Newell's Old Boys as the club that made him, um, and and the fact that he learned a lot of these principles uh, at Newell's, I think uh, Leeds fans have been taken away in the romanticism of Bielsa, and, and they've decided, I want to see where all this comes from. You know. Yeah, I I, I totally agree what you said there, um, especially with the litter, and I think that. That, that's for me. That's a bit Bielsa effect. He grounds people. You know, wait, hold on. You might have a flash car, big watch. You know, everything's shiny. But let's not forget, you're, you're no better than the person that makes your meals, looks after you, physio wise, and and that's what he. he I said this the other day on the other stream where Bielsa's totally revolutionised not just the team, but the city as well. I mean, we're a one club city, and now we're in the Premier League. We're up there with the big boys, and now. It's just for me, he's uh, yeah, he has immort immortalized himself in Leeds history, and that there's no, there's no going back because let's not forget that 16 managers, 16, 17 managers previous, have all tried and failed. Apart from you know, Grayson, who got us promoted obviously to championship. But uh, what do you think, Oscar? Do you agree with that? Or, yeah, I mean, if you look at it and think, obviously, I've always spoken about Jose Mourinho. We obviously remember what happened to him at Chelsea. You know, he had the argument with the club doctor in that lot. There's complete lack of respect there. I just think with Bielsa, there's a feeling that everyone's equal. That's the thing. It's just a feeling that everyone's even, everyone's equal in that lot. And um, and everyone will get their opportunity if they work for it. I think that's the big thing with Bielsa, that you're either with him or you're, or you're not with him. You know, we've seen a lot of players at Leeds, you know, as, as you'll remember, Danny, you know, Izzy Brown, Lewis Baker, a couple of players who were decent players, you know, all right players, you know what I mean? You had good talent in that loss. Um, John Kevin Augustan, you know, the last one, of course. 
you're all decent players, but you're either with Bielsa or you're not with Bielsa. So if you're not going to put the work players in that lot, I mean, I've heard quite a bit about Augustan, to be fair, the last couple of days and that lot. I don't want to be ITK in the know and all that lot, but I have heard that there was not a great relationship between the dressing room and Augustan. He came in a bit all guns blazing on his first day. Um, and and yeah, look, if you can back it up, fair enough, but it's not... If you've got a footballing brain, you don't do that with Marcelo Bielsa. You know, you're humble, you listen to what he says. You know, you listen to what he says because with Marcelo Bielsa, to me, he's the type of manager where you, if you're a, fo- if you're a footballer and you've played a career for five or ten years and you go to work under Marcelo Bielsa, you kind of learn how to play football all over again. You know, I think the words... Yeah. I went on a live stream a couple of, week, a couple of weeks ago and they, and they asked me, sum up Marcelo Bielsa in a phrase and what, what he's done to you and... I think he's totally changed my perception of football. Totally changed my perception of football. The fact we've got the best defensive record in England. You know, we've got a winger at left back, you know, a converted winger at left back. Pablo Hernandez, you know, playing in centre midfield and that lot, you know, making crunching tackles. And it, it is pretty mad, to be fair. At, 30, it's mad. at 35 as well. At 35, you know, and you wouldn't be asked. The thing is with pa- uh, Pablo Hernandez, you wouldn't be asked to tell he was 35 unless someone told you that. You know, the way he moves, the energy and all that lot. But you just, and sometimes you, I've noticed with a couple of players with signs. You know, I think Helder Costa, um, obviously, we brought him from Wolves, as Jamie will probably um, be aware. You know, he's not had a great first season. I think he's been okay, but I, I do expect his second season will be a lot better. Same with Jack Harrison. I think it takes a bit of time to adapt to Bielsa because, you, as I said, I think you just learn how to play football all, all over again. You know, this idea that, um, you know, in the modern game, you get, look at Bayern Munich yesterday, you know, that Canabry, all that lot, inverted wingers. But with us, it's an idea of just keep the pitch as big as possible. And it, it's totally, it's totally unique to me, to any other manager. You know, a lot of people have said, oh, who do you see as the next Bielsa in that lot? But I honestly don't see anyone... You, know, you could say Mauricio Pochettino, but even Mauricio Pochettino, I don't think he's he's full. He's probably the closest out of them all. He's probably the closest out of them all to Marcelo Bielsa. But again, I don't Bielsa. think he's so unique. Yeah, Bielsa's I like think... the original blueprint, isn't it? Yeah. Sorry, Tony, go on. No, there was just two points there I want to make. On your last point about players learning how to play football again, and you mentioned Bayern Munich. I saw a tweet last night about the, the Barcelona and Bayern Munich match. And uh, Arturo Vidal was playing for Barcelona, who played for Bielsa under, uh, uh, for Chile. Of course, and yeah. some, somebody tweeted that, uh, how can this be the same Vidal that played under Bielsa? He's not, he's not tackling, he's not pressing, he's not running back, he's not, he's not doing anything that, that he was doing under Bielsa. And, and, and that speaks volumes because I think Bielsa teaches certain uh, you know, actions uh, that players that he wants players to implement on the pitch. And I think when he's gone, he's not managing more anymore. You've got a different coach telling him to do something else. So um, it was a funny tweet because it's like, okay, Vidal looks, you know, a shell of the player last night that he was under Bielsa for Chile. And there's a reason for that because he's not being coached by Bielsa anymore. Um, and then the other point I wanted to make, just going back to, I think we, we spoke about the players that, you know, he, he didn't fancy basically when he came in and perhaps players that have egos and like to flaunt, you know, how much money they have. Bielsa leads by example. He's walking around Leeds in a tracksuit. He's living in a flat in Weatherby. Um, apparently, he has a small car, but nobody ever sees him driving it. He eats in local restaurants and he um, drinks in, in Costa. Um, so if that's your manager, if that's the person you're looking up to as a role model, are you going to be driving in in your Bentley in, in, uh, with, your, with your Rolex watch? Is that going to impress the manager that you want to pick you to play on the team on Saturday? No. But if your manager is coming in, driving a Bentley and flaunting his wealth, um, then it's probably okay in that dressing room. But, but I think Bielsa leads by example. He's, he's shown in, in his own actions and how he lives himself that all that stuff doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We're here to play football. We're here to win football matches. And, you know, uh, whatever wealth you've accumulated um, leave that to the side when you come in here to train and you come to play football. And I'm not saying that's why he didn't fancy some of those players you mentioned, but he, as you said, Oscar, he, he obviously looks at players and he sees traits that aren't going to fit in with what he's trying to do at a football club. And he's very quick to move those players on. I mean, Pontus Janssen, Kamar Roof, 
Oh, great so players, good. right? He played, played well under Bielsa. But no, there, was some, yeah. there was something there that he obviously thought, no, you're, you're not for me. You know, I mean, he used to go. learn with Pontus Janssen. The most interesting thing was with every... Pre, I mean, he's pretty much interviews themselves. You know, it, that I can I can watch that myself. I, I I never know. I never used to ever watch a press conference of a of a Leeds United manager. I never ever watched a press conference. But Marcelo Bielsa, you can bet any money you want. I'm watching that press conference. If I can't watch it live, I'm watching it anytime. You know, I'm making sure I watch it. But the big thing with Pontus Janssen was he kept saying in every press conference and the build up to the end of last season. Pontus Janssen, he's been our best player this season. He's been the best player in the, in the team by a mile. And it's like it's almost a... The thing with Bielsa is, I don't think he follows logic in some ways. Not not that I'm saying it's a negative thing, but there's, a, there's something to Bielsa that you can't just quantify him. You can't. That's what I think is so unique about him. You can't just quantify him. You can't just say, oh, he does this, you know. Because there's some games where you watch Leeds United play, and you've got Stuart Dallas, who I'm sure you are aware of, Jamie. You know, he's played left back this season, he's played right back, he's played in midfield. And you're watching it and thinking, where actually is Stuart Dallas playing today? You know, we had a game against Barnsley, I'm sure you'll remember this, Danny. You know, the, the game that ultimately sealed promotion. I mean, Barnsley were all over us, and, and we were trying to work out, myself and Joe at the time, watching the game live, and you know, what system are we playing here? You know, this is this is absolutely confusing. I mean, it works. We won the game, but that's the unique thing about Marcelo Bielsa. It's never going to be, it's never going to be boring. That's the thing. Even if the results are not there, it's always going to be innovation all, at all times. But one thing I just wanted to ask you about, Jamie, and one thing I really am intrigued with, um, and it's something probably in the comments people won't be happy about me asking. Spygate. What was the reaction to that? For New York? <laughs> was it a big overreaction? Um, I think from the point of view of Newell fans and people who knew about Bielsa's career before Leeds, people who'd follow him in Argentina and in other clubs in Europe, it wasn't that surprising really because Bielsa was known for having these long, long press conferences for talking in a language that normal football managers don't um, talk in. You know, he's a very academic way of speaking. But in terms of, like, when he said, okay... He went and he sent someone to spy on Derby County. Am I right? Yes. Frank Lampard. Yeah. So, um, and he, Bielsa basically said, well, what's wrong with that? Like, you know, this is, you know, we're, we're doing opposition reports all the time. We're doing research. We're, 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 watching, we're watching games. What's the difference? And, and, and he was right in that he said that back in my home country, this isn't seen as um, something bad. Because I don't think it is. I think in Argentina, um, Pochettino came out with a, a quote when he was at Spurs. I think Spurs played Chelsea one day and uh, Deli Ali was accused of diving. And uh, Pochettino said in the interview afterwards, we were taught how to dive at Newell's. You know, he didn't mention Bielsa specifically, but he said, you know, part of our game was, was learning how to cheat because it was win at all costs. And I think that is part of the Argentine football psyche. There are, there's a huge culture around refs and who refs support and why did they give a yellow card to him during this game and not give another yellow? There's a huge kind of culture of, you know, are these teams trying to cheat? Are they trying to pull a fast one? So I can see why Bielsa was like, what's wrong with this? Because of the background he has and where he comes from. Um, the reaction of the English press was huge. It was, it was crazy. But I think, um, I think he's come out better from it. Like, I think the fact that he had that press conference, he said, look, at, look, at this, um, look at these spreadsheets. I don't need to cheat to win because I'm sitting for 16 hours a day at a desk watching Middlesbrough games or Derby County games. And I have all these, like, Bielsa's coaching staff is huge at Leeds, isn't it? There's been a lot said that he has all, he's had eight or nine people that he's brought in, basically unknown coaches yeah. um, from Spain and from Argentina. And there's more people on the bench for Leeds than you see at other clubs. He, he puts in so much work into the background research of players, who they're going to play next week. And somebody tweeted yesterday that, you know, a lot of Leeds fans thought that when the, the, the Victor Orta and it was Angus Kinnear went out to um, Argentina to hire Bielsa, that he said, oh, I've already watched every Leeds match last season. Somebody tweeted yesterday that actually that was a misquote. And he'd actually watched every championship match <laughs> this season. It wasn't just Leeds. So I think... From that point of view, like Bielsa, okay, he sent someone to watch uh, another team training, but like that wasn't really going to give him an advantage because he does this huge wealth of research to give him the information he knows to play in the right way. 
And just to go back to your point, Oscar, about players being converted into positions they never played in before, the, the team changing and transforming their shape. Um, that was that was true at Newell's as well. So I spoke to, um, I've been working with Phil Hay, who works at The Athletic, who Leeds fans will know. He's been interviewing people at Newell's and I've been the go between introducing him to players and translating from Spanish. And we've done some interviews with R Ricardo Lunari, who played under Bielsa at Newell's. He went on to become a coach himself. So he's now a pundit in Argentina. And he said that when, when they trained at Newell's, and it might be the same at Leeds, because we were talking about this murder ball, you know, this, this uh, drill in training where Leeds fans just, the ball is thrown in and they play until they, they're going to collapse. And Lunari said, we did that at Newell's. And an interesting point that he also made was that um, at Newell's, they spent so much time training defensively, so training defensive tactics, shapes, positions, what they had to do when they didn't have the ball, that when it came to attacking, they just said, do what you like. Well, when you have the ball and you're attacking, if the left back wants to run and try and score a goal, fine, no bother. But you, you better do everything that I've taught you defensively. We've seen that at least. I mean, the, 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 the goals have been spread around the team so much. You have people like Luke Ayling popping up with a goal. You've got centre-back scoring. You've got midfielder scoring. And I think that was, I mean, a lot of people say, oh, Bamford doesn't score enough goals. But because Bielsa has trained the team so well to attack as a unit, it means that there were other players who could score the goals that Bamford couldn't. And that goes back to Bielsa's early days at Newell's. He didn't care about attacking as much. He said, as long as we can keep water tight at the back, win the ball back, he said, whoever wants to go forward and join the attack, do it. But if you lose the ball, you better be back, you know. So I think that we've course. seen that at Leeds as well, you know. Yeah, we saw it, especially at Wigan away. I don't know if you remember, Oscar, where uh, Josh Windass had the, uh, the, the look, they launched the ball into our half. And within within two or three seconds, there were like seven white shirts around this one lone. It, just, it was like a shark hunting, do you know what I mean? Where they're all just around the prey. And uh, just to go back to... commentary on it, didn't they? Yeah. Even, the, uh, even the commentators were like, wow. Because it, it's... For me, I I, 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 I won't be saying, I won't go saying, oh, Bielsa, yeah, I've known about him for years. It's only when I heard about him, I started to look into him and what it's like. I mean, I heard about it on Football Manager. There was a Bielsa press tactic that you could download. And I thought, what's a Bielsa? Do you know what I mean? But um, but just to go back to your point on about working hard to get into Bielsa's team and retraining for different positions, Stuart Dallas is a prime example of that. He, he gives 120% every time. And he, he's naturally a winger, I think, isn't he? And he's, he's, he's played all off the park. And that just proves that if you work hard for Bielsa, then you, uh, you'll you get in his team and you'll be re rewarded with that. Also, um, I was just wondering, just going to the left a bit, um, obviously former Newell's players, um, Messi, Maradona, Bielsa, are they... Uh, renowned in Newell's a lot because I remember um, you saying on a podcast about Messi's not really about much yeah I mean I think um, when you look at the idols of Newell's or the club legends Bielsa's probably number one in, in most uh, Newell fans eyes and then you've got two others so you've got um, uh, Tata Martino who played for Bielsa uh, is the most capped player in Newell's history and actually came from that Bielsa School of Management. He is one of those players like Pochettino who uh, became a manager. Tata Martino came back to Newell's as a manager in, in 2012, I think, and won the league in 2013. So he's won, the league, he's won the league with Newell's as a player under Bielsa, and he's won as a manager. And then he got the job at Barcelona, people remember. So uh, I think the, the story goes that Messi, as a Newell's fan, had seen what Martino did at Newell's and said he needs to be the next manager of Barcelona. He didn't have a good time at Barcelona, but since then he had a short spell as the um, Argentine national team manager. It didn't work out for him. He, uh, last season, he won the MLS with Atlanta United, and he's now the, the national team manager of Mexico. Very good coach, very good coach, Martino. And he's, you know, he, they say that red and black is running in his blood because he played so many games for renewals and he won the title as a player and a manager. The third one then at the moment is actually our current captain, who's Maxi Rodriguez. So people in England might remember him. He played for Liverpool. He's still playing. He's uh, 39. He'll be touching 40 soon. And he started his career at Newell's, went to 
Europe with Atletico Madrid and Espanyol and Liverpool and came back to Newell's after Liverpool and played for Martino in 2013 and won the title with Newell's with his hometown club as well. Uh, he went away for a while a couple of years ago and played with uh, Peñarol in Uruguay, won the title with them as well, scored the, last, scored the title winning goal in, in injury time. And then last year he came back to Newell's for a third or fourth spell. And he's the captain now. He is seen as, you know, representing what you as old boys is uh, as a club. There's so many players you can go through that started at Newell's. There's Gabriel Batistuta. There's the current Argentine manager, Lionel Scaloni. Uh, there's players like um, who are playing in Europe at the moment. Uh, Mauro Cardi was a, was a Newell's fan as well who moved to Europe at a, at a very young age. There's just so many. Walter Samuel was a great defender. Um, but with Messi, he... I suppose he, he, he was, his family were Newell's fans um, when he was young. He started in the, in the youth sides at Newell's and played in a, in a wonderful team that they called the Machine of 87 at Newell's. So they were basically kids who were all born in 1987. And they went three years unbeaten as a youth team. And Messi scored something like 500 goals. It was incredible. Um, and then, of course, when he was 12 years old, he went to Barcelona. So he left Newell's at a very, very, very young age. But he's always, he's always, you know, said that he's a Newell's fan. He said in an interview that his dream was always as a kid to play for Newell's in the Premier Division in Argentina. Uh, he's been pictured wearing Newell's shirts. His kids wear Newell's shirts. He's a huge fan of the club. Um, so although he never got to play for the first team, there's still a huge, um, it still seems to be a dream of him, of his, and it's a dream of the fans as well to see Messi come back and play for Newell's and, after Barcelona's performance last night, we were starting to hope that it could be sooner rather than later, you know. Um, there's a lot of barriers to get, to get over and challenges to make that happen. Um, you know, I think a player of, of Messi's stature has, has probably never come back to play in Rosario. Maradona played there for five games, but this is a kind of a... Messi's just on another level. He's very settled in Spain. Uh, his, his kids grow up there. He lives there with his wife, who's also from Rosario. Um, and I think it's, yeah, there's some, there's some challenges in terms of what the Argentine league has to put in place and his safety as well, you know, because as I said, Rosario Central fans hate Bielsa. They don't like Messi either. And if he's going to come and play in Rosario, he has to be safe. He owns a lot of property in Rosario. He owns a restaurant. He owns apartment blocks. He was married in Rosario. Um, but even if we could just see him play for Newell's for six months, I think that would be a dream come true for, uh, for Newell's fans. Do you see, Jay, him one day, Bielsa and Messi? Is that the dream then? Bielsa goes back to Newell's for a year. Messi goes back at the same time. Because Messi, obviously, as we said earlier on, has got that dream to play under Marcelo Bielsa. Is that where, it all, obviously, from Lee's point, fans' point of view, we're hoping that's in the distant-ish future. Um, but there's, <laughs> there's not much you can do to, um, you know, it's Bielsa's dream to go back to Newell's by the looks of things and Messi's dream as well. There's not much you can do about that by the looks of things because financially, I don't think Bielsa and Messi, as you were saying, it's, it's genuinely no. in the heart. I don't think that comes into it. No. Like it does with other players. Do you, do you see yeah. that? Is that the feeling in Newell's? Could that one day happen? Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of Newell's fans say that. They're like, oh, Bielsa, come home. We want Bielsa to come back. Um, but... Personally, just speaking personally, I, I wouldn't be upset if he didn't because I think he's created an incredible legacy at Newell's with the titles he won. And I am fearful of the opportunity to maybe put a little bit of a dent in that. Um, Argentine football is very different now from when Bielsa was manager 30 years ago. Um, I think that, you know, it, it's not going to be straightforward to replicate that success now. So I would say that if, you know, if Bielsa doesn't come back to Newell's, I'm not going to be upset because I think he's already given enough to the club. He doesn't, he doesn't own Newell's anything. Why would he come back and, and be manager again? OK, if we were on the verge of relegation and we had a half a season or a season to stop ourselves being relegated and it was an option, you'd say, OK, Bielsa, come and save us. But if he couldn't save us then, what's that going to say about his legacy, you know, uh, we can't chase the name of the stadium back now, you know, it's, all, it's the Estadio Marcelo Bielsa and we want to keep it that way. So I'm personally speaking, I don't think he should come back to Newell's. I think if he comes back as a director of football or a, a, in a ceremonial role, 
that's fine. I don't want to see him back as manager. Um, uh, Newell's fans will disagree with me. There'll be many who say, I, I want him to come back for kind of romanticism's sake. Um, well, I, said, I, next, I think me and Danny um, certainly agree with you, Jamie. We, we don't want him to go back either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Um, I, I'd love to see Pochettino, you know, uh, come back and manage Newell's one day. I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. Uh, because as you said, you mentioned the financials and, and the wages. Like, if Messi comes to Newell's, he's probably just going to have to play for free. Like, because, I mean, the, the, the wages that Newell's pay players is an absolute pittance compared to what they earn in Europe. Probably the same as someone like Pochettino or Bielsa coming back. Um, so, any, a lot of players that come back to Newell's, they do say, I've come back for the harsh. It's not, I'm not coming back here to make money because, um, I mean, we've just re signed a, a club legend called Ignacio Scocco, who played about six games for Sunderland. He was a failure in England, but he's a, a legendary striker in Argentina. He's 35 now. He scored, uh, he's the fifth highest scorer in US history, and he's played the last few seasons at River Plate, where he won the Copa Libertadores, which is the South American version of the Champions League. And he, he's still going to score probably 20 goals a season for Newell's or more. But uh, he had offers to go to China for contracts worth a few million. Uh, and he decided to come back to Newell's. And, and, and you see that trend with players like Maxi Rodriguez is the same. He could have gone abroad to China, to the Middle East. Um, the, the offers are there for a lot of these players. But there's a huge, what they call a sense of belonging with players who've come through the Newell's system that they want to come back uh, and hear the fans chanting their names again. They want to play on this pitch. It's almost sacred. And you can kind of make the connection with how Biel Bielsa's principles and morals with the sense of belonging that players, fans and managers have with Newell's. There's a real feeling that we're here for the club. We're here for the football. We don't care about money. We just want to be part of this club and this family because it means everything to us. And I think um, that's, that, that's why I love Newell's, you know, because that's, that's what I hold really uh, close to me in terms of being a football fan. I, I really, like, I'm one of these people now who think it's, it's I want Bayern Munich to win the Champions League because I think PSG, Man City, Red Bull, Leipzig, I think they're fake clubs backed up by, by dollars and money from abroad. And I'm one of these people who wants to get back to basics, who wants to see hometown players win titles for the clubs that they, that they were born to play for, you know? Um, so I, I think Newell's Old Boys still has that. I'm not sure for how much longer, but in Argentina, the fans still own the clubs. There's no foreign ownership. There's no, you can't take over a club in Argentina. The fans own it. And that's why I started watching Argent, Ar Argentine football and started following Newell's. So um, I'd recommend it to anyone who wants to get that, um, that sense of, of romanticism in football back. I think, I think Leeds have it because they've got Bielsa and they've got a lot of homegrown. They've got players like Kevin Phillips, who's from the club. Um, but there's so many teams in the Premier League and in Europe who've completely lost that sense of identity. And, uh, and a, a club like Newell's have stayed true to that identity. And I think that's why they're so endearing to, to fans like myself. I, I agree. Um, I think, like, you just, just going sideways on what you said again, uh, Calvin Phillips, he's a local lad. You know, he, he came through the academy and he's a graduate and he's, he's absolutely flourished in this team. Uh, how do you think this Bielsa team, obviously you've seen us play a few times over the, uh, the past two years and stuff. You've, you've seen how we work, the typical Bielsa style, the press. Um, how do you think we'll, we'll do in the Premier League? Ah, good question. Um, no pressure. Yeah, no pressure. Um, I, I think they need a few signings, but that seems to be happening already. Um, I think that there's probably a few players there that, might not be Premier League standard, but did really well in the championship. Um, and I think that the good signs are there for Leeds because he's planning for the future. He's, he's going back to the kind of Bielsa 101 guidebook. Let's buy some young players who look really good and let's develop them. And that's, that's really, uh, you know, I think if they can sign Ben White, if they can send, sign Ben White, it'd be huge. You know, I think that's a, a Premier League class centre back that you need. Um, and, like, I think if they, if they didn't get relegated next year, that'd be success. I don't know how Leeds fans feel, um, but I think if they can stay in the Premier League where Leeds belong, I think that'd be a great achievement. Um, but I think that, they, yeah, they probably, probably need to see a few more signings now. There's certainly three, four players from the team last year who I think can play in the Premier League, Phillips, 
uh, Ben White, of course. Um, I think the goalkeeper looks very decent. A messier, that is. Um, I, I'm not sure about Bamford. I think he's a good championship level striker. I'm not sure about him in the Premier League. Um, and then you're kind of wondering, does there Hernandez have the legs for the Premier League? He's a wonderfully talented footballer. Um, but you'd wonder, is there someone else coming through there who can take his place eventually? So uh, I think they still need a couple of signings. I think Ben White should be number one target um, and, and, and a striker as well. Because he's had... Biel, Bielsa doesn't necessarily... He's not in love with strikers. Like he, If you look back at Newell and other teams he's managed, the striker is not, not the most important part of the team. And I mentioned earlier that you have midfielders and defenders chipping in with goals. So I think he, he's used Bamford you know, really smartly in, in the sense that Bamford will chip in with a few goals, but the pressure wasn't on him to, to get Leeds promoted. So um, in the Premier League, that might be different, but I think he's at least need to get, he needs to get a decent, a kind of a Bamford level, if not higher, striker to come in there. And either if he's going to go with Bamford in the Premier League to play second fiddle, the, the other strikers haven't worked out that he signed. So he needs to get that one right. But I think if they, um, if they, if they, if they stay in the Premier League after next season, I think that's a that's a good start. How would you see then, Jamie? Um, say Tottenham leads is the first game of the season. For argument's sake, could well happen. Could well happen. Obviously, you know Tottenham. He's made a good signing for me in uh, Hoiberg from Sams, and I think that's a superb signing. How would you see that game going between? Would you see Bielsa Leeds United going there? Playing against Jose Mourinho, obviously, you know, Jose Mourinho is not known for the fantastic free flow football. Do, do you see Leeds going there, dominating possession and really taking the game to Tottenham and being able to successfully do that? Yeah, against Mourinho Tottenham, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm not a fan of Mourinho at all. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that straight out. I think uh, I think it was a terrible appointment for Tottenham. He's done really well. I mean, he's, he's gotten us from 14th to, I think we finished 7th or 6th in the end. But I, I don't, I, I think going from Pochettino to Mourinho is. Uh, Step backwards, um, but in saying that, I think I think what Bielsa does with Leeds is um, he actually he makes the players believe that they can get a result against anyone, and I I do believe that Bielsa sometimes you'd fancy him against the, the better teams on paper than you know the likes the teams that they're expected to beat, and we saw that with Wigan last season, and we saw that with QPR. I think. When Bielsa doesn't have a good day, it's usually against the teams that they're expected to beat. So I give I give Leeds a chance against Spurs. I give them a chance against Chelsea, against the Manchester teams. I give them a, I give them a chance against Liverpool. You know, um, I think that Bielsa teams are better as underdogs. You know, and he see and and and, and just go back to Newell's to 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 look at that. Newell's um, are not we're not a big club. We're not expected to win three titles. Um, and he turned these street footballers, these young, raw uh, youth talents, into 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 title winners. So I think I think um, Leeds are Leeds are, are going to be are going to do well as underdogs. I think that if if they actually uh, start to become the favourites in too many matches, it's not gonna, it might work out as well. Do you see? Yeah, you know, obviously, talk, just very quickly on Tottenham. What are you thinking this season for Tottenham? Like, just a quite general. What are you, are you going to push the top four, or is, or is it a real mess at Tottenham at the minute? I'm, I'm, I'm very. I said it all. <laughs> I'm very, I'm very, I'm very skeptical. I'm are very you fighting skeptical. to lead the top four? Oh God, I don't know. I want to see. I, I, I'm looking forward to watching this Amazon documentary first um, to see what happened in the last season. I think that. Um, Pochettino built a great side and he actually did what Bielsa's done in terms of making a lot of probably average enough players into into really world class players um, I think that uh, there hasn't been enough of a transition into changing that team into letting people go um, Mourinho I think has already m- made mistakes in the transfer market he signed a guy called Gedson from Benfica who doesn't look Premier League standard whatsoever and Pochettino didn't make that mistake as much. Pochettino signed players who he could develop and make into Premier League players. I don't know if Mourinho has that anymore. Personally, I think Mourinho, Mourinho hit his peak a, a while ago, a long time ago. I don't think he's going to have any of the la- same level of success as he's had in his career. I think there's young managers like Pochettino waiting to come in behind him um, who have better ideas, who are more inspiring to players. Um, I think Mourinho was a, was a poor appointment by... Spurs, but the 
there's a, a psyche at Spurs now that we have to win trophies, and we've always had that. You know, where's your trophies? Top four doesn't mean anything. You got to the Champions League final, you bought with it. So I think that that has gotten into the minds of, say, the owner, Daniel Levy. And I, I think he thought, right, I'm going to need to win a trophy here. And, and that's why he went for Mourinho. But, you know, I, I don't agree with that approach. I think that we should continue to develop a team organically that is, is going to challenge the, the top teams. I don't think that we have to spend millions of, Euro, uh, millions of pounds a year just to win the FA Cup or the, the Carabao Cup. Um, I, I think Mourinho as a character, I don't think he is a good influence on the dressing room. I don't think he commands the type of, of relationships that Pochettino built with a lot of the players at Spurs. Um, and I think now that since Pochettino left, I think there's a few players at Spurs who've possibly thrown in the towel, you know, and, and thought... Mm-hmm. I, I, I don't feel like I'm playing for Spurs anymore. I'm in this big new stadium and I'm playing under Mourinho. It doesn't actually feel like the Tottenham that I know, you know. There is one player um, talking about potentially leaving Tottenham. Who I'm sure I've just kind of thought to actually ask you about, um, just when we were talking about Tottenham, uh, Mr. Juan Foyf, um, yeah. Yeah. With United, if we can't sign Ben White. I mean, obviously, I've seen little bits and pieces of Juan Foyf. He seems very technically gifted. Maybe not the biggest, the most physically imposing, a couple of little, little bit rash maybe from time to time. But from what you've seen of Juan Foyf, obviously he's, not, he's hardly played, I don't think, is he played at all under Mourinho? I don't think. I think he's Mauricio Pochettino signing. Do mm. you see him, um, having seen Ben White as well, if Leeds can't sign Ben White, should they go for Juan Foyf as far as you're concerned from a Tottenham fan's point of view, from what you've seen of him? I, I do rate Juan Foyt. I think I think he's got bags of potential. I don't think he's the he's the finished article yet. And I think it'd be. I'm not sure about replacing Ben White with him. Ben White played 46 games in the championship last season. Juan Foyt has been sitting at the bench, not even getting onto the bench at Spurs. Yes. Um, Juan Foyt needs to play, needs to play, and he needs a club that's going to bring him in uh, as centre centre back. Or he's been playing right back. He, 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 he made his debut for Argentina a few months ago under Lino Scaloni. He played right back in a friendly and he was very impressive. He was very impressive at right back, even though he's known as a centre back. So Bielsa might like that and might like to so see, oh, he can play it right back already. Great. He's going to fit into the team. I think to throw one fight in at centre back or right back in a, in a newly promoted team in the Premier League might not be the best option. He needs, he needs to maybe play more games at a side where the risk element isn't there, where he can go and maybe play in the championship next season. Um, so I think it'd be a great signing for Leeds, but I'm, maybe as an understudy to Ben White, or maybe, as, you know, maybe if you can get Ben White on loan again and Juan Fight can be bought as his eventual replacement, it would be good. But I'd be very careful about throwing Juan Fight in uh, as a starter in your first season back in the Premier League he needs development. He, he, would have, he would have developed under Pochettino. I don't think he's going anywhere under Mourinho. I don't think Mourinho is going to develop any, any young players at Spurs. He's just going to buy them. Um, so I would, I mean, I'd, I'd be totally in favour of one fight, either going out on loan or being sold for the good of his career. I think, I think he's a, a great talent, but I don't think he's going to give Spurs much under Mourinho now. So, so that's, that's, that's basically, I think he'd be a great buy for Leeds, but I, I would be careful to throw him straight in as a starter, you know? I mean, he doesn't seem a Mourinho-type player. I think even, you know, not just his age, I think his whole build, I think Mourinho likes power and, like, athleticism yeah. and that lot. And, yeah. you know, six-foot-three centre-halves are just going to literally just head the ball away and just kick it away. Not, like, technically... Because Foyf, to me, um, stands out as particularly technically gifted. But is there any players from Tottenham who you've looked at this season? Um, obviously, cause it's been a bit of a transition season for you who play for Tottenham this season, maybe younger players, you know, talking maybe 25 and under, who you look at and think, you know what, let's send him out on loan for a season to Marcelo Bielsa and it'll do work well for both Leeds and Tottenham. Is there anyone who you'd mention, maybe feel? I think that, I think that um, we're, we're going to, we've got a midfielder called Oliver Skip. I think Fulham are going to sign him. Saying, I knew you were going to yeah, say yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think I think Fulham are going to sign him. He's been on the kind of fringes of the of the team, very much how Harry Winks was about three or four years ago. But he's not going to get the playing time at Spurs at the moment, so he should go out and loan. I, I, we haven't seen enough of, of Skip playing for Spurs. He comes on at, in the 80th minute every once every two or three months. Um, I think that if I think Messier is the number one now, but I think um, if if you hadn't 
of signed him um, and you were you were letting Casilla go, I think uh, Paolo Gazaniga would have been a, it would be a great signing for any any uh, team maybe that's coming into the Premier League for the first time. He's a great goalkeeper, obviously he's from Argentina um, and he's actually from the same town as Maurizio Pochettino. But I think Hugo Lloris would be could continue to be number one at Spurs. Um, apart from that, I mean Spurs have a huge squad now, and I, I just feel with Mourinho, he, he doesn't actually know who his best players are. He's, he's bought in Bergvine, he sold Ericsson, he's got Son, he's got Kane. Um, yeah, I mean there's a there's a there's a defender now that he's he's trying to blood through called Tankanga. Tankanga. Uh, he's a, a homegrown player from the Spurs academy. He's been injured for a while, but he just signed a new contract. He's very much in, in the Mourinho mold. You know, uh, he's a, a six foot something, quite a heavy defender, tough tackling. He was really good when he started at, at, at his first few games at Spurs. I think he's going to persist with him. I don't think he's going to go out and loan. Um, so, I mean, Oliver Skip, yes. Juan Foyt, yes. Um, but with Mourinho, it's, it's very hard to know who he fancies and who he doesn't because he's, he's changed the team quite around a lot, you know. Like the t- I think the team that Mourinho was playing at the start when he, when he took over at Spurs is quite different to who, who he ended the season with. So I still think he's not really sure of his uh, best players yet. Very interesting. Well, I guess, Danny, at this stage, we're now in 15 in, I'm going to let you uh, take the floor here, mate. Yeah. You, you little bit well, because of it, theories. Yeah. Yeah, there's, uh, because it is a special episode, uh, what better time than to debut our little trivia segment? And it's called All Smart, Aren't We? And you are the debutant onto our little, uh, well, the first bit of the segment, really. So, uh, Oscar, can you set up basically what it is? You get 45 seconds to answer as many general knowledge questions as you can. Um, I'll, they could be random. They could be about cheese making. They could be about Bielsa's cat. You never you never know. They're just general, general knowledge. I don't know the name of Bielsa's cat. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, disappointing, disappointing. Oh, God. Uh, so, right. Um, let me know when you're ready with the timer, Oscar. Okay. We're approaching... We set, so, 45 seconds, we are saying. Okay. All right. So when it gets to thirty, we'll uh, we'll go. Yeah, we'll we'll start at thirty. We'll start at thirty. No pressure, Jamie. Um, yeah. a big oh, chance to put, a, put a good, healthy score on the and scores. Go. Give me one Leeds United nickname. The White. Yeah. Uh, which club did Diego Maradona last play for in Europe? Barcelona, Sevilla, or Napoli? Uh, Sevilla. Correct. Who is the world's, world's most expensive teenager? Uh, Joe Felix. Incorrect. Mbappe. Who is uh, who is the oldest manager in the Premier League? Uh, Roy Hodgson. Correct. Uh, has Zlatan Ibrahimovic ever won the Champions League? Um, no. Correct. What is uh, how old is Marcelo Bielsa? Sixty-five. Correct, and that takes you uh, up to forty-five seconds. Time. That is time. Well done. Well done. Yes. Six. What did I get? Six. Six. That's good. That's good. All right. Okay. Good healthy start. Oh, healthy start. It's, uh, good healthy start. You've set the uh, standard now, Jamie. You set, you've, you've set uh, the standard and I can I can let you know. Yep, you are top of the leaderboard. You are oh, top yeah. of the leaderboard. You was Caraco. <laughs> oh, you was Caraco, indeed. <laughs> Thanks, thanks, thanks for jo- thanks for joining us today, Jamie. Uh, it's been a great insight. I'm sure I'm sure Oscar agrees, uh, and we, we all feel that little bit closer now to Newell's old boys. Um, obviously, oh, yeah. there is. I think I think there'll be loads of Leeds fans once this pandemic and lockdown thing has all gone away. Uh, you'll see more white shirts than red, probably. <laughs> Absolutely. No, thanks to you guys, and thanks to all the Leeds fans as well who've supported. You was all boys so much uh, since the Elsa took over. You know, um, it's been amazing. Uh, thanks for following my account on Twitter. It's it's been amazing to connect with so many Leeds fans. And uh, yeah, wishing you all the best in the in the Premier League. And uh, if there is anybody, if there is anybody that's uh, planning to travel to Rosario, just uh, send me a, a direct message on Twitter, and uh, we'll help you in every way we can. And that's at Newell's underscore en, as in the English. Yes. We will exactly. leave a link obviously in the description as well, guys. So yeah. if you want to check out uh, Jamie, make sure you check out the link in the description to his Twitter. 
and you can follow them there. <laughs> and when you make your journey to Newell's Old Boys next season. So I guess, guys, I guess we can we can leave it there anyway. Um, best of luck for the season anyway, Jamie. Um, apart from when you play us and that lot, if you can if you can take a couple of points off Chelsea. Um, Villa, anyone down there then that'll be a massive help too mate but uh, we'll leave it there anyway best of luck to you as all boys too Danny, absolutely top class mate we'll leave it there anyway see you later guys thanks lad, all the best